All right, if you'll take your Bibles, please. Open them to the book of Hebrews, and again in the sixth chapter. <clears throat> we come to Hebrews chapter 6. Again, we're going to look at the same verses that we've been looking at. We're very close to moving on to chapter 7. Just not quite. Um, if you'll stand with me, please. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6, beginning again at verse 19. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would grant to us wisdom in this day. And I pray, God, for the declaration of your truth. I pray for your mercy to be upon me. I pray, God, that you forgive me for my own sin and for my own inability to be all that you've called me to be. And I pray that you would use your truth in spite of me. I ask, God, that you would open my mouth and that you would grant that your words would be spoken with clarity and with truth and with understanding. And I pray, Lord, that in this day, you would change hearts. I pray that you would draw us into yourself, cause us to see the world according to your truth, and to see Christ for all that he is. God, we just thank you for Jesus. I pray, Lord, that anything that I might say that is amiss or out of line would be taken away, and that only what is true would remain, and that it would go forth from this place with power to accomplish your perfect will. And we ask in the name of Jesus. God has established here a simple truth that we have to deal with. We have to come to grips with the truth that on our own, we are not acceptable in the sight of God. It's not a popular thing. It's not a common thing. It's not something that is going to win friends and influence people if you tell them that they are not clean and not acceptable in the sight of God in the light of their own sin. And yet it is the truth. It's true for them and it's true for us. Taken on our own merit, the Bible teaches us that we are ruined, sinful, and condemned, worthy of the hell to which we are destined apart from Christ. Now this is the problem that Jesus came to address. And this is the singular and eternal question. How is a man made right with God? It is true that we need a priest. This is a universal problem. <coughs> we need somebody to stand in the way between us and God and intercede on our behalf. We need somebody to go before God and make our relationship with Him right. And this is a universal need. There is nobody on the face of the planet who ever has been or ever will be, apart from the person of Jesus, who has not needed this universal reality of a priest. Look at me at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> We're just going to read a few verses out of Romans 3, starting at verse 10. Paul says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. So right away, you understand that sometimes when you talk to people about the need for a Savior, the objection that you get is, but I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. I do good things for people. I don't do all the big bad things. Yes, I have a few problems, but I'm a good person. And, and that's the way that we see ourselves. And, and sadly, that's often the way that Christians see themselves. That, that's how people who profess Christ see themselves as well. And sometimes we see ourselves in that light because God has been merciful to us 
and has called us to life and has given us eyes to see Jesus and to repent. And we somehow think that we did that. We, we tend to think better of ourselves than we deserve. And this is the human condition across the board. And if I have been hammered and beat and, and sometimes even brutalized on any point of my theology more than any other, it starts right here. It starts at the reality that people are defiled in every aspect of their nature, defiled in every aspect of their character, defiled in every aspect of their existence, and are not on their own merit ever, ever capable of being accepted in the sight of God based on their own work. That is the universal truth of Scripture. And there is no place in Scripture where you can point that's going to undercut that truth. The scripture is very plain. And so when we're talking to people, we need to understand the reality of their basic need. This is not going to make them happy. But for us, we need to also understand that we are included in that basic need. We need this same priestly intervention. We need somebody to stand on our behalf because the fact that we are accepted by God is not a credit to us. It is a credit to Christ. It is a, it is a credit to God. It is a credit to His mercy and to His kindness and to His extravagant love with which He loved us whom He has chosen before the foundations of the world. It is not a credit to our intrinsic worth. It is not a credit to our intrinsic goodness. And I've had people say, well, then you're just saying that God makes junk. No, I'm not. But God certainly does. He says, I make this pot for dishonorable use and this pot for honorable use. And the pots that I make for dishonorable use, they're dishonorable. That's plainly taught in Scripture. But that's not the point. The point is, is that God doesn't look across creation and say, oh, I like Jean because she is a very kind person and therefore I'm going to make her my own. Now, Jean is a kind person, but that's not why God chose her. You see, God doesn't choose us based on any merit in us. He chooses us based upon His own good pleasure. And this is because the Scripture tells us that no one is innocent, and no one does what is right, and no one does what is good. There, there's no exclusionary clause in that. There is no way which we can look at what the Scripture says and say to ourselves, well, this person is better... Because the standard is not better than you. The standard is equal to God's goodness. And that's where we get sideways. We get sideways because we do not understand what the bar of righteousness actually is. We tend to set the bar pretty low. We look around and find the slimiest person we can name and say, I'm better than they are, and feel good about ourselves. But that's not how God views us. God views us in light of His perfect law. God views us in light of the Ten Commandments and in light of His moral mandate, which He has given to us and said, This you shall do and no other. And you can take all of the thou shalt nots and all the thou shalts, and you can boil them all down to one and kill yourself on that one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And if you are honest with yourself, at all, you will recognize that every moment that you draw breath, you violate that commandment. Beloved, that's all of us. We need a Savior. We need a priest to intervene on our behalf. Because there is nobody who does not need this Savior. This has been our inheritance from our father Adam. So all the way back, as far as mankind goes... All the way back to the very first man who ever was. This has become our inheritance. Look at me at Romans chapter 5. Skip forward just a couple of chapters from where we left off. Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to how many? <coughs> All men. Because how many? All sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, 
Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him to come. So what this says is that even though anybody may not have sinned particularly in accordance to Adam's sin, we all still bear the taint of Adam's sin. That original sin has been passed on to the entire descent of Adam. The technical term for this is imputation. It is God crediting to you something that you may or may not have technically done. And somebody immediately is going to cry foul and say, That's not fair. How would God charge me with sin I didn't commit? Well, if we read through the rest of Romans chapter 5, which we don't have time to do this morning, we would see Paul lay out the very simple truth that because God imputed sin, it opened the door for God to impute righteousness. Now, I don't see anybody jumping up and down and saying, that's not fair. God can't impute the righteousness of Christ to me because we all benefit from receiving that imputation. But the reality is this. God can impute righteousness to us because God imputed sin to us. It makes them of the same kind. This guilt that destroys us not only impacts our standing, it also impacts our nature because it has an effect on us. Having been predisposed to hate God, there are none of us who do not actively run down that path. There is nobody who does what is right. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 3. That means that the natural sin, the imputed sin of our father Adam, has destroyed us. And what it does to us is makes us want to rebel against God. It makes us want to go our own way. It makes us want anything but what God says. And you don't have to be very awake to look at the world around us and see that having its head. You do not have to be completely conscious. You only have to be slightly conscious. Just enough to have your eye open just a little bit to look at the world around you and see that this is bearing more and more fruit, that it is coming on in full flower, and that it is manifesting itself in every way conceivable to man. That man is inventing new ways to rebel against God. He is doing everything in his power to destroy the fabric of the universe. That we are turning our incredible natural ability that God has given to us to subdue the earth, to turn it into something hideous, and that we are doing everything that's in our power to turn every good thing that God has given to us into ruin and decay. This is our culture. This is where we are. This is the people to whom God has called us to minister Christ. And they are not innocent. They are not guiltless. And so before you can even address the reality of Christ being a priest, you have to address the universal, eternal need for a priest. This is something that everybody needs, and everybody has always needed it, and everybody will always need it. There has been priestly intervention between God and man since the fall. You say, well, I don't read about a priest in Genesis chapter 3. Well, then you're not paying attention. In Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, there is a priestly intervention. It's just kind of hidden in the folds. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of what? Skin. And clothed them. Now you tell me something. This is farm country. Most of you have been around critters at least a little bit. Have you ever safely gotten a critter out of his skin while the critter's still alive? Have you ever done it unsafely? I would contend it can't be done. You cannot divest an animal of his skin without first killing that animal. So when the scripture tells us that God made for them tunics of skin, what's implied in the background? That God killed the animals. Now because God tends to run to type, I would imagine that the animal skins that they were provided with was lamb. See, there was a priestly intervention in the Garden of Eden. And the priest was God. That's fitting because there is a priestly intervention at Calvary. And the priest is God. 
The Calvary God is both the priest and the sacrifice, both the slayer and the slain. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And that word bruise should be rendered crush. It pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin. I'm going to read that again. When you make his soul an offering for sin. What, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a sacrifice of reputation. We're talking about a sacrifice of substitution. We're talking about Jesus being offered as a sacrifice by God. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, the law of sacrifice has been the only means by which we can come into the presence of the Lord since the beginning. And this is because God has established the reality that blood stands as the only ordained means of atoning for sin. Leviticus 17.11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul." So this has always been a need of mankind to have a priest intervening on their behalf to, to offer the sacrifice that includes blood and to offer that sacrifice on behalf of the one who needs it. This has been the pattern of Scripture. This has been the pattern throughout the beginning. And this eternal need is also a pressing need because this is the only way that we will ever be washed of our sin. Hebrews 9.22 says... According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, beloved, understand this. This universal, eternal, pressing need is exclusively answered in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Jesus told us himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except for me. So what we need to understand is that the need for a priest is specifically, biblically defined as the need for Jesus to be our priest. Nobody else. No other figure from history can stand in that place. No other religion can offer you peace with God. No other path to God exists. No other opportunity for redemption exists. No other path to forgiveness is real. And no denial of a need for forgiveness is going to hold any traction when you stand before a holy God. Because every single one of us will stand before a holy God. And every single one of us will give an account of ourselves when we stand before, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, the judgment seat of Christ. Wherein we will all receive from Him the works done in the body, whether good or bad. Paul goes on in the very next verse saying, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We need to understand this. Because this is our commission as the church of God. This is our commission as the people who belong to Jesus Christ. We have been commissioned to share the good news that there is a priest who has been offered in our place and that the offer of forgiveness is a real one and that it is not an offer that will be ever extended through anyone else. Because Jesus Christ, according to the writer of Hebrews, has become, think about what is said in Hebrews 6.20, even Jesus, who has become our high priest forever. That means there's not anybody else that's ever going to be able to fill that role. This is exclusively something that belongs to Jesus. Nobody will ever be able to replace him as high priest. There is not a high priest 2.0 coming. There, there is not another opportunity. There is nobody else who will ever be able to fulfill this role. And there is no retirement date for our need for Jesus as high priest. He has become for us exactly what we need for now and for eternity. He will be our priest forever. We will always need a priest. Let me put it this way. We will always need 
this priest. We will always need Jesus Christ as high priest to intercede for us because I assume, perhaps wrongly, but I assume I'm not the only one that keeps messing up. In fact, it's a little more than an assumption because the scripture tells me that we're never going to get this right until we stand before him. But here's what's interesting to me about that. He is a high priest forever. Which means that when we stand in heaven, having been glorified, we are still there on his merit. He's still going to be our priest. He's still going to be the one who has made a way for us, which means he still gets the glory. What is the song of Revelation 4 and 5? Worthy is the Lamb because you were slain, because you have been raised, because you have been just, you've justified us in the sight of our God, because you are our priest. That the truth is, is that we will never escape this reality. So trying to downplay it now because it's unpalatable to people who are spiritually dead is foolishness of the highest order. We dare not downplay this. We dare not speak of, of some other path to God. We dare not allow that to even be considered because we will always need this priest and he will always be sufficient. That means that your sin is always going to be paid for by the blood of Christ and that the payment that has been offered is always going to be found acceptable to God. Now, that's pretty cool. It truly is a one-size-fits-all offer. You, know, you buy that stuff on the internet, one-size-fits-most, it should say, because it never seems to fit me. Jesus is a one-size-fits-all offer. Your sin is always going to be paid by the blood of Christ if you are found in Him. And His payment is always going to be accepted by the God who is the standard of truth. You need never fear that something you've done or something you're going to do is going to be enough to undo the work of Christ. Because He has become your priest forever. And the singular sacrifice that He made and the offering of Himself is a sufficient payment for all of time and eternity. Even once we are in heaven, Jesus is still our righteousness and hope. Now this means that there will be no revisions. Right now, there, there's a great hoo-ha going on about all of the things that are supposedly going on that are going to allow Israel to rebuild the temple and re-sacrifice some sacred red cow of some variety or another that the scripture doesn't talk about. But all these things are presupposing that there is a need for the temple. Because of a really faulty understanding of, of how Scripture is taught, um, there's a whole lot of people who believe that, that Jesus is going to come and take the church away and then Israel will revert back to the Old Testament law and be saved by adherence to the Old Testament law. Now I want you to think with me for just a moment about what that teaches us about Jesus. That Jesus is not the way, but Jesus is a way. Never mind how Paul plainly tells us in Galatians and in Romans that nobody has ever been saved by obedience to the law. In Galatians, he says it most plainly. He says that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It just doesn't happen. Nobody will ever be saved by obedience to the law. Never have been, never will be. There are no revisions. You will not be able to revert back to Judaism and thereby somehow be acceptable in the sight of God. This is the bulk of the content of most of the New Testament. Paul fought the Judaizers tooth and nail in every city he went to. Because they were constantly teaching that people needed to be Jewish in order to be Christian. And they were constantly teaching people to revert back to the law and to obey the Old Testament law. That Jesus simply prepared them for obedience to the law and that their obedience to the law was what was going to save them. This is a lie from the pit of hell. It was then and it is now. So I want you to understand that much of the common teaching about the end times is based on very bad theology. 
Israel as a nation is not going to be the hope of the world. Israel as the people of God of which we are a part. That is the hope of the world. Now I'm not talking replacement theology. I'm not saying that God has no use for national Israel. I'm not saying that God has no use for ethnic Israel. Because Romans 9, 10, and 11 tell us completely, constantly, if they tell us anything at all, that Israel, the people, will be grafted back in. But it also tells us that not all of Israel is Israel. Now, I'm not being anti-Semitic. I love the Jewish people. But I have to be faithful with what the Scripture tells us. The Scripture tells us that our hope is Jesus Christ and not anything else. The scripture tells us that an attempt to revert to any other thing is false to Christ. Nobody will ever be saved by any other sacrifice. Now this also means that there are no new revelations that are going to refine or alter what the Bible has given us about who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished. So on one side of the church track, you have the, the super hyper Israel people that are determined that the dispensationalism is right and all these things have to happen. On the other side, you have this whole new revelation of new apostles and new truth that are being brought out constantly. And, and it's, it's a travesty. Because none of these things are faithful to the Scripture. Jesus Christ has become our priest forever. He has accomplished what needs to be accomplished. And He has satisfied what needs to be satisfied. And there is no further work on His behalf to be done. It's It's finished. He has fulfilled and accomplished the work that He came to do. There is no expiration date on the blood of Christ. God will never, ever stop requiring and honoring the blood of the Lamb. Now, if there's two things contained in that sentence. God will not stop requiring the blood of the Lamb, and He will not stop honoring the blood of the Lamb. Because ultimately, all of these other things that try to make some new way for people to God dishonors the death of Christ. It makes it less than it was. It makes Him less than He is. It makes the entire structure of the death of Christ in our place for the sin of the people become a travesty. Because if some other means were possible, then Jesus didn't do a noble thing. He did a stupid thing. If some other means were open to us to get to heaven, then Jesus didn't need to die. In fact, he didn't need to come. He could have just sat up in heaven and done what he'd been doing and everything would have worked out. And for us to pretend that some other means is open is to make Jesus a footnote it's to make him a, a parenthetical idea that God used for a short term until he scratched his head long enough to come up with something better. But that's not what the Scripture teaches us. What the Scripture teaches us is that Jesus Christ has become our priest forever. And in that action, he has fully and completely satisfied God's requirement and all of human's history, in fact, all of creation's history, pivots around the cross of Jesus Christ. That there is nothing in all of history, either human or otherwise, that doesn't find its center in Christ. You say, that's a really huge statement, Pastor. How can you say that? Because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the creation itself groans to be delivered from the bondage that the sons of God have put on and that the fulfillment of that groaning will come when God redeems His people fully and finally and glorifies us and sets us free from this world. Beloved, it all pivots on the cross. Everything. It all displays Jesus in the fullness of His beautiful glory. And more than anything else, I expect the world to get this wrong. But I'm tired of the church getting it wrong. The people of God need to understand that Jesus Christ is the whole banana. He's all of it. He is everything that matters. He is the fullness of God made plain to us. And if we're soft on that, then I question if we know Him at all. We cannot make room for some other theology to sit alongside Christ 
on the way to heaven. This means that we're going to be unpopular with the religions of the world. We're certainly going to be unpopular with the governments of the world who want us to just pretend like everybody's the same. We're going to be unpopular on every front. But I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. I would rather be judged by the world and find favor with God than be judged by God by finding favor with the world. It really is a binary equation. You will either please God or please man. But you cannot do both. This is because of the singular nature of Christ. Either you are found in Him or you are not. Now, Jesus is our high priest. And this means that He is above all. There was no higher priest. There wasn't a high priest and a higher priest. And there certainly wasn't a high priest and a higher priest and a highest priest. There was only the high priest. And nobody stood above him and nobody mandated anything. He was chosen by God. He was the authority that allowed the people to come and talk to God. When the, when the working priests, the under priests, fulfilled their obligations to offer the sacrifices for the people, they did it under the authority of the high priest. And all of that was done under the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement once a year going into the Holy of Holies and spreading blood on the altar. Uh, on the, the Ark of the Covenant, excuse me. And when the Ark was missing, then on the place where it should have been. All of this is because God was teaching us that there is only one hope and one authority and one path to get to Him. This one hope, this one authority, this one path is Jesus Christ. And while the high priest of Israel was chosen by God, selected and anointed by God, remember that it was the family of Aaron chosen, chosen by God, in the same manner Jesus Himself was selected and anointed by God. And we have evidence of this in Jesus' baptism. Look with me at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 13. So Jesus is just beginning his ministry. John the Baptist has been preaching. And Jesus comes to John the Baptist. And we'll pick that up at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John of the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, You, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? <clears throat> But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for this is fitting for us now to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him to be baptized. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And here's what's interesting about that. When Jesus was baptized, he was being baptized in obedience as an act of consecration. And God, in sending the Spirit down visibly for others to see, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't possess the Spirit previously, as some do. But sending the Spirit down visibly was a stamp of God's anointing of Christ's ministry. Because the oil which was used to anoint the priest was in evocative of what? The Spirit of God. They used oil to picture the Spirit. Well, this picture that God chose to use wasn't a rain of oil falling from heaven. It was the descent of the Spirit like a dove. The actual person of the Spirit coming to Christ in the form of a dove and giving his actual voice of approval saying... Yes, this is my son. I'm well pleased in him. And I'm well pleased in everything that he's doing. This is the anointing of God for the fulfillment of Jesus' ministry. Now, this was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61 
we find these words. This, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So in that, we see a picture of a redeemed people. We see a picture of a people who have been sanctified, who have been bought, who have been made holy in the sight of God, and we know that the blood of bulls and goats has never been able to take away the sins. So if these people have been made holy, then who did the making? God through Christ. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These people have been made holy because Jesus himself has come. Verse 4. They shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. The de desolations of many generations, the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God, and you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth. And I will make of them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among all people. And all who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord and my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, and the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before the nations. So we find in this passage this picture of Christ fulfilling, or this picture of God fulfilling what he promised. And, and we need to understand that Jesus pronounced this prophecy fulfilled. Look at Luke chapter 4. And this is immediately after his baptism. Luke also um, gives us an account of the baptism of Jesus. But Luke is the only one who tells us that after he went to be baptized, he went home to Nazareth. And in Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16, we have this. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recovery of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all were witness to him, and all marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And that word marveled and bearing witness, it doesn't mean that they were favorably impressed means they were fairly shocked because their question, isn't this Joseph's son? It implies, we, we know this kid. He can't be the Messiah, and he just claimed to be. He just took what we all know as a messianic prophecy, which we just read in Isaiah 61, and he applied it to himself, and he told us, today, this messianic prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. What was Jesus doing? 
He was declaring who he was at the outset of his ministry. He was declaring his, his person as God. He was declaring his role as Messiah. And he was declaring his work as priest. And he was saying, I have come to fulfill this prophecy. And the fact that I have come demonstrates that God is serious. Now, we, we've addressed before the fact that in the Old Testament there were prophets, there were priests, and there were kings. And they were all separate beings. They all had roles to fulfill. But Jesus has become for us all three. So I just, in passing, because he talks about him being a priest forever, it, since he has become all three in one person, it's also implied that he is all three of those forever as well. And we need to recognize that. He has eternally become our priest. He has eternally become our prophet. He is eternally our king. So just very quickly, I just want to address each one of those just a little bit. Jesus became the prophet. Now remember, the prophet's job was very simple. The prophet was the one who communicated from God to the people. He spoke the words that God was giving, and he spoke them to the people. It was the prophet who had the thus saith the Lord job. Now, it is Jesus now who delivers to us the final word of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. And I want you to see what the writer of Hebrews tells us. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, Jesus, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus has become and delivers to us the final word of God. And we've been talking all morning about how he has become priest. So I'm only going to give you just a few pointers here. First of all, he offers the sacrifice that makes a way for the people to come. Every person who desires to come must come by the intercession of the priest and by the sacrifice because no other will ever be offered. If you universally need an intervention by God or by somebody to atone for your sin, and there is only one offered, where do you go? To that one. We must come to Christ. This is the only sacrifice that will be given because without the shedding of blood, there is no possibility of the forgiveness of sin. We already looked at Hebrews 9.22. Now, Jesus has also become king. Now, he is the one who has been given authority over all things. It is Jesus who has been given the authority to rule the world by God himself. Look at me at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5. Philippians 2, starting at verse 5, Paul writes this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, <clears throat> did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance of the man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, verse 9, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. Those of heaven and those of the earth and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You say, well, that doesn't say anything about him being king. What does the word Lord mean? It means master. It means owner. It means boss. 
You say, that still doesn't say king. Okay, fine. Look at me in Revelation. Revelation, verse chapter 19. Starting in verse 11. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now, John tells us in chapter 1 of his gospel that... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who is the Word of God? It's Jesus. So who are we talking about here? It's Jesus. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. That sword is his Word, by the way. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. So there it says king. And just to defend my earlier statement, it also equates king and lord together. See, Jesus is king. And he will always be king. And Jesus is the only king that we will ever have. He is the only king that we will ever need. And there is one question that divides all of mankind from one another. It splits all of humankind into an us and them relationship. And it is a question that must be addressed by all who seek to understand and by all who seek to affect change for mankind. It is not the issue of the color of our skin or of our ethnicity. For God tells us in Acts 17, 26, that he has made us all of one blood. As he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. So our ethnicity is not the question that divides us, because under the skin we are all the same. And any Christian who doesn't understand that needs a lesson in remedial biblical understanding. We are all one. There is no call for any of us ever, under any circumstances, to be ethnically hateful towards anybody else. Because they are from another country, or they have other customs, or they have other worship practices, or they have other preferences, or anything else. If they belong to Christ, they belong to you. Period. If they do not belong to Christ, they do not belong to you, but it is not because of their ethnicity, but because of the fact that they are spiritually dead. So we, of all people, need to have this right. There is no excuse. God is not going to accept our excuses because he has been very, very plain. So this is not the question that divides us, although it is the question that the culture uses to divide us. Beloved, if you're not aware of the fact that you're being played on the race card, you're not awake. You need to open up your eyes and you need to understand that this is a game being played. And that the systemic racism that's being accused against us is a lie with no purpose other than to divide us one against another. And it needs to be the church who is on the forefront of breaking down these walls. It needs to be the church who is on the forefront of speaking truth, and I'm not talking about kneeling and kissing the boots of somebody. I'm talking about us as Christians loving other people, period. That is our job. That is our obligation. That is our right, and that is our privilege. For we ourselves have been loved by God. And if you don't understand how that obligates you to love, then you need to back up and pay attention to what Jesus said. But we have to take the lead on this. There is no excuse for racial prejudice to exist in the church. And there is no excuse for racial prejudice to exist in anyone who names the name of Christ. Period. I don't care where they're from. It's also 
also not the question of gender identity, sexuality, or other such charged topics, at least not exactly. You see, God made two genders, male and female, men and women, nothing more, nothing less. He established them at conception. And gender is established in a person at the point of conception. Who they are is who they are, and it will be expressed in their bodies, period. Boys have different parts than girls. And it shouldn't take a Supreme Court justice to be able to define what that means. You see, God has also gone on to say that the only legitimate sexual relationship between those sexes is one man and <laughs> one woman for one lifetime. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. And, nope, just male and female, that's all he said. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, we are getting drawn up into a conversation that we should just be simple about. I don't need to worry about how you identify. I just need to know what God has said. I don't need to be mean. I don't need to be cruel. I don't need to be obnoxious. But I also don't need to play your foolish games. Truth is truth. God has spoken. I am a man who lives on truth. That's what the scripture tells me I'm supposed to be. It also tells me that this is not about a person's relationship to the environment. It's not about our adherence, adherence to the eco-Nazis that demand our obedience and to imaginary systems and problems. For we were given dominion over the earth. It is ours to use. It is ours to subdue. And it is ours for the glory of God. We have been given the opportunity to enhance and to create order from the chaos. Beloved, it's also not dividing us among those who are willing to submit to some new world order or WF, WHO mandates for world domination. We have been commanded to submit to one king and one king only. That king is not Klaus Schwab or George Soros, or Joe Biden, or any other pretender to the throne of the universe. The king is Jesus Christ. He is the one to whom we submit. He is the one to whom we owe our allegiance. And all of these final questions dance around the point, but they don't strike the center. Because they speak of allegiance. They speak of submission to systems of thought. There is only one question that truly divides all of mankind, and put very bluntly, it is this. Do you belong to Jesus Christ, or don't you? Are you found in the Lamb, or are you not? Are you washed in His blood, or are you not? Are you born again, or are you a once-born worldling who is still dead in your sins and trespasses? You will be one or the other of those two binary decisions, and that's all you can be. There is no middle ground. There is no compromise on that question because Jesus is not going to stand at the door of heaven and say, I really like you. You're a nice person. Come on in. He's going to stand at his throne and say, this one is mine. Behold my blood upon him. Nothing else matters. And if you're not clear on that, and you don't know the gospel. Beloved, we have to be a people who understand this truth. We, as the people of God, must understand the real issues that divide us from the rest of the world. And we cannot be eternally sidelined by the chaos of the culture. Look, I could have spent all day going through all the things that they're trying to divide us with. I hit three or four big items, but they're nothing in the swamp that is around us. But here's the majesty of it. God knows that we are a stupid people. And he gave us one answer to all of our problems. One answer to all of our questions. One answer to all of our needs. And that one answer is Jesus Christ. And for us as Christians, we need to recognize the truth that our obligation is to press in, to run to Christ, to cling to Him, and to trust Him as priest, as prophet, as king, 
to be the one who delivers us from our sin and delivers us unto our God. Jesus Christ has become our priest forever. And he is sufficient for everything that that implies. Beloved, as the church, as the people of God, we have to understand but this is an exclusive reality that Jesus has obtained. And for us to try and introduce any other thinking into that reality denies the Christ that we say we love. I beg you, be careful how you speak and to whom you speak about it. Be intentional as you express the truth of Christ. Be purposeful with the gospel. Do not compromise the truth because you know that the person to whom you're speaking won't like it. Speak the truth. Let them not like it. Let them not like you. Come what may, do what they will. The only one to whom you will finally give an answer is God. And it is our obligation as the people of God to represent Him faithfully. So as you're speaking to people and as you're looking at your own life, there is only one question. Are you found in Christ? If you don't have that answer right, nothing else matters. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you give us grace for your glory, God. I pray that you would give us a perspective on truth and on reality that changes everything for us. And I pray, God, that your mercy would be lavished upon us for the sake of the name of Christ. God, I pray that you would make us mindful of your great love for us. I pray that you would make us mindful of his intervention and his intercession on our behalf. I pray, God, that you would make us a people who glory in the fact that we have been bought by Christ. That it's not our worth, but it's his. This is not our work, but it's his. It's not our death, burial, and resurrection, but it's Jesus's. And in his we take a part. God, let us live high in the name of Jesus. And let us carry the gospel to a dying world. Let us carry the gospel to a world that is already condemned. And in the gospel, let us bring them home. Father, make us effective for the sake of the name that Christ will be honored by hearts where he is now hated and despised. God, I do ask that you would be merciful to our nation. That you would turn us from the path of destruction. But Lord, we also know that America is not necessary for you to fulfill your will. God, we ask for mercy. And we trust you to do what is right. It was grace to stand in that fact. In the name of Jesus, we pray.